Okay, thank you, Yusuf, for um, a very spirited and engaging discussion this evening about this most important question of, are the Gospels based on eyewitness testimony? I think we've seen clearly that the answer is yes, based on the undesigned coincidences we've looked at, the unexplained illusions, the external corroborations, and that's just a fraction of the overall evidence. And I've not even done those topics justice. There's a lot more that could be said on each of these individual topics as well. And so we have tremendous evidence for the Gospels being based upon the testimony of eyewitnesses. I don't think any of you says objections held up this evening. I think that all, um, really all of his allegations of error and contradiction in the Gospels turn out upon further inspection to be very weak and uh, difficult to support. Uh, since the Gospels are in fact based on eyewitness testimony then, um, I think that we have to take seriously what they say concerning Jesus' um, death and resurrection to come from the earliest apostolic witness. And that being the case, then we have to take seriously that the resurrection of Jesus um, was indeed of the polymodal character as described in the Gospels, as reported by the apostles themselves. It was extended across 40 days, so it was not just one brief and confusing episode. If then Jesus rose from the dead, and one could give a whole lecture on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, then Christianity is true. The message of the Gospel is true. You know, C.S. Lewis, who is a famous 20th century theologian and, and fantasy author and writer, he wrote in his book, God in the Dock, um, as a collection of essays on theology and ethics, that Christianity is a religion which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And so I think it's incumbent upon us that this is not the end of our discussion this evening. Rather, it's only the beginning. I want all of you to go home and research these arguments, research this. Use this as a starting point for further study, for an analysis of the public evidence bearing on Christianity and Islam respectively. Use the statements that we've made this evening for your own, uh, as a springboard to begin your own investigation of these topics. If the gospel is true, then it has profound implications for our identity and who we are. It has profound implications for what we were created for. It has profound implications for salvation. It has profound implications for where you will spend eternity. The gospel of Jesus starts with God's holiness. The God is absolutely perfect. He's holy. He's maximally righteous. He's maximally just. And since God is maximally just, he must come against sin with, with utter righteousness and perfection and justice. And since the Bible says that we've all fallen short of God's standards, we've all sinned, We've all broken his law, and therefore we come under the just indignation of a holy and righteous God. We've violated his law. We've failed to live up to his standards. As the book of James says, if you, even, if you keep the entire law, yet you just stumble, stumble in one point, you are guilty of violating all of it. And so the book of Romans says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we have no idea what that means. For we were God-hating and God-rebellious creatures. And God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great tremendous love and compassion for us, in the person of Christ Jesus, God, the second person of the triune Godhead, Jesus Christ, the God-man, walked among us. God in human flesh. God poured into a, into a man. The fullness of the divine substance. And according to the God's foreordained plan, having lived a righteous life, living every single moment of his life perfect before God, every single moment of his life Worshipping God as he ought to be worshipped, honouring him as he ought to be honoured, praising him as he ought to be praised. That should cause us to marvel. I mean, we've not spent a single moment of our lives perfect before God. But Christ lived every moment of his life perfect before God. And according to God's foreordained plan, he went to that cross of Calvary. And on that cross, he absorbed our guilt, our shame, our sin upon himself. So that God poured upon him the judgment the fierce indignation of a righteous and holy God against sin upon him. That justice that was meant for us. So when Christ, Christ took that cup of divine fury that represents God's wrath upon the nations, he took that cup and he drank it right down to the very dregs, such that when he cried out, hey, let's die, it is accomplished or it is finished. It's as though he turned over that cup and not one drop fell out, for he consumed it right down to the very last drop, the very dregs. And so by trusting in Christ, by throwing ourselves at the foot of the cross, we can enjoy salvation and eternal fellowship with him. Trust in Christ, for he is mighty to save. Islam cannot save you. Muhammad cannot save you. Allah cannot save you. 
Only Christ, Jesus, can save you. Thanks for your attention.